Hey guys, welcome to this video. My name is John Watts. I'm a consumer protection lawyer and a big part of my practice is suing credit bureaus and companies that provide or furnish information to credit bureaus for credit reports. And this is a decision I want us to look at. It came out just a few weeks ago, well, maybe a month or so ago, November 19, out of the Northern District of Illinois. And this is the Tanya Johnson versus U.S. Bank and then also Experian, one of the credit bureaus is also a defendant. And really four main things I want us to take from this, and then we'll go through the actual text of the opinion. So what are some commonly used Fair Credit Reporting Act words or terminology? And then I want us to understand the date of status arguments, kind of both sides. Now we won't get into it in detail. If you'd like me to do a video where we really dive into what's called Metro 2, which is the industry standard, I'm happy to do that. Just let me know in the comments. And then third, we'll talk about can you sue both the furnisher and the credit bureau when you dispute false information through the credit bureau and it does not get fixed? And then how do you plead willfulness? And then just in general, what damages can you recover? So let's take a look at this. And so we have this Tanya Johnson bringing suit against U.S. Bank Home Mortgage and Experian and only U.S. Bank moves to dismiss the claims under what's called Rule 12b-6, which says you fail to state a claim. And in other words, it's not plausible what you say. And so the court should just throw the case out now and not even get into discovery where we take depositions and exchange written materials. So here's the background. The judge says... In looking at 12b-6 motion, you assume the truth of the operative complaint's well-pleaded factual allegations, but not its legal conclusions. So when the lawsuit, the complaint says, well, this violates the law, the judge doesn't have to give that any weight. But the factual allegations have to be believed as true. And then any documents attached to the complaint or referred to the complaint uh, will be fine to consider here. And the facts will be looked at favorably to Johnson, the consumer, because Johnson's not the one moving to dismiss. That's U.S. Bank moving to dismiss. <laughs> so the court says, look, I'm going to set forth the facts, but I'm not vouching that these are op objectively true. And so I have in red some of the kind of terminology that we see in the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So we have trade line. That just means the account, in this situation, a mortgage, to Experian, which is a consumer reporting agency, also called a credit reporting agency, a credit bureau, all those are the same thing. And then U.S. Bank is a furnisher of information because it is literally furnishing information to the credit bureaus about the consumer, in this case, Johnson. And so then her account was reported as partially charged off and charged off status means the debt has been deemed uncollectible. Now, here's kind of the crux of the argument. So Johnson says, hey, you have this field in my credit report called the date of status and that should remain static. In other words, not change because the charge off date stays the same. In other words, there was a moment in time when the account was charged off. And so that should be reflected in the data status and it should not change. And then there's another field labeled first reported date. And that also should remain static. And that's the date in which the debt had its first major delinquency. And again, that has a, sort of a, an understanding or meaning within the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And typically this is going to be the time when you're about six months late that you never recover from, okay? So it's not the first delinquency. That would be literally the first time you were delinquent that you never recovered from, never brought current. But this will be the first major delinquency, which again is about six months. So U.S. Bank says, no, 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 no. We can, we can change the data status, the first reported date, in some circumstances, furniture could properly amend both fields to reflect more recent events. Now, the judge is not going to decide who's right and who's wrong about whether or not these fields, and when I say field, I mean, it's just a 
the, all the different sections under an account or a trade line. So you have Capital One, you have Midland Funding, you have U.S. Bank, and it'll have all these little fields in there that data is put into. So that's what they're talking about. Judge is not going to decide who's right or wrong. He's just going to say, is the complaint plausible right now? That is it plausible that the defendants could be held liable for this? So here we go. Parties disagreement on this point presents a factual dispute as to credit reporting industry practices. And so that has to be resolved in the consumer's favor. So here we have our first code section. And I've tried to, and hopefully I've got all of them, the FCRA code sections in green just to make them stand out. So section 1681 S2B, that's a duty on furnishers like U.S. Bank to take actions after receiving a dispute uh, about the account that they're reporting. Now, they have to get that dispute through the credit reporting agency or the consumer reporting agency or the credit bureau. Again, all those mean the same thing. Now, accuracy is not defined specifically, but we have some regulations that say correctly reflects the consumer's performance and other conduct. So this being the uh, probably the most important word here, it's got to be correct. It has to be truthful. And so a judge says, whether change to data status or first reported date undermines the accuracy, thus depends on how furnishers and consumer reporting agencies customarily use those two terms. And industry practice is a question of fact. And so the court says, well, then I'm going to give the consumer the benefit of the doubt on these allegations that the date of status and the first reported date must be static must never change in order to remain accurate. And the judge does point out that the Seventh Circuit, which is the appellate court over the district courts or the trial courts in Illinois, uh, has a case called Gillespie. And it says, holding consumer reporting agencies practice of amending the date of last activity potentially led to unclear disclosures under 1681G. 1681G is your right to go get a copy of your file uh, that the credit bureaus have. And the judge says, with that underbrush cleared, the remaining background is pretty straightforward. Originally, the date of status and first reported date was August 2015. Sometime in 2018, that changed to June 2016. And so then the consumer, and this is key, you have to dispute through the credit bureaus. So the consumer initiated a dispute with Experian, and Experian then must forward the dispute to U.S. Bank unless it's going to fix it without doing that. And then U.S. Bank continued to furnish the wrong June 2016 dates to Experian. So now let's get into the law a little bit. So you can take a dispute directly to the Consumer Reporting Agency, and that's under Section 1681I. And the agency, Experian, Equifax, TransUnion, they have an obligation to investigate. Part of their obligation, unless they're going to fix it without doing anything else, is they must give notice of the dispute to the furnisher. That would be U.S. Bank. And once that furnisher gets the notice of dispute, now they have five obligations, and I have these in blue. So number one is conduct an investigation. Number two, review all relevant information provided by a consumer reporting agency. That's why it's a good idea. Whatever you want the furnisher to investigate, give that to the credit bureaus, okay? So that then they will pass it on to the furnisher. And we've talked about this in a number of videos. The more detail you give, then the greater the obligation to investigate is. See, if we're just very vague, like, hey, I think something might possibly be wrong somewhere, uh, anywhere, I don't know, within my account, well, they don't have much obligation. But if you say, hey, you're reporting the uh, these two status accounts or two status uh, fields incorrectly, here's what you did report, now here's what you're reporting that's wrong. Well, that's very, very specific, okay? So again, number one, conduct an investigation. Number two, review all the information provided by the Consumer Reporting Agency. Number three, report the results 
to the consumer reporting agency. So you got to investigate and then tell Experian or Equifax or TransUnion, whoever it is, here's what happened. And if that information was inaccurate, so in other words, you're having to fix it, you've got to tell that to the other credit bureaus to do your best as a furnisher to make sure all the information is consistent. And then finally, number five is if the information proves inaccurate or unverified, you got a couple options, modify, delete, or permanently block the report up. And there's a private right of action to enforce those duties. This is key, 1681 S2B, if that's violated, you can sue. And S2B is when the furnisher gets notice of your dispute through the credit bureau. Now, if you go directly to the furnisher, that is under section 1681 S2A, and you cannot sue for that. It's fine to go directly to them, but you've got to go through the credit bureaus and then have the credit bureaus notified the furnisher to get to this S2B. All right, so what does Johnson focus on here? Saying whether U.S. Bank conducted any investigation and the reasonableness present questions of fact. And so you cannot dismiss the case. And the judge says, she's right. So whether the furnisher's investigation is reasonable under S2B is a factual inquiry. So whether it's reasonable is a factual question normally reserved for trial. And so the judge says, I'm going to accept factually what you're saying here, that altering the date of status and the first reported date is against industry practice. And a reasonable investigation by U.S. Bank would have uncovered those errors identified. Thus, it is plausible, given those facts, it's plausible U.S. Bank did not undertake a reasonable investigation. So what does the bank argue? Bank says, well, you failed to allege what information you included with your dispute to experience, such as the specific date she was disputed. Do you see this ties in with what, I know I keep harping on this, but you've got to be specific. Can't tell you how many times people come to me and they say, here's this just horrible error. And they explain it to me. I go, oh my goodness, that's a terrible error. And they say, yeah, and I disputed it and it didn't get fixed. I say, well, let me see your dispute letter. And, and they're kind of hesitant to do that. Finally, whether it's a credit repair organization, whether it's a consumer, whether it's a lawyer, they finally give me their dispute letter and it's just garbage. I mean, there's nothing to it. And I'm like, you, you had a fabulous lawsuit if you had done a proper, specific dispute. And you can see here, the bank is saying, hey, you didn't tell us exactly what dates you're disputing. And the judge says, you're wrong. Because here are these three paragraphs, 17, 18, 19. It says, here are the errors. And then paragraph 20 says, open to dispute with Experian. So it's an inference that what was disputed in paragraph 20 of the complaint are the items in 17, 18, 19. Now, a better way to plead this thing is to be very specific about it. Here's exactly what we said. Or attach your dispute letter. You can redact or block out personal information. But put that in there in the complaint so there's no argument about this. And then the bank says, and this is such a common argument. I mean, we've been dealing with this for probably 20 years where the bank says, aha, you pleaded yourself out of court because you said it was Experian that may have erroneously changed the dates. This is such a, a bogus argument. And I, I, I'm always amazed at these lawyers because they're usually at these really big firms and very fancy firms. And these people went to the best schools and top of their class. And I find it hard to believe that they really don't understand the basic rules of federal civil procedure because the truth of the matter is they do, and they're just lying to the court. Because the judge says, look, federal rules allow alternative, even inconsistent pleadings, recognizing parties may tailor their theories as they conduct discovery. So you can say, hey, there's false information on my Experian report. I disputed it to Experian. Experian says they went to U.S. Bank, and it was verified. So I'm going to sue Experian, and I'm going to sue U.S. Bank. So Experian would be under section 1681i for a lousy investigation, probably under EB for failure to have reasonable procedures to assure maximum possible accuracy. 
But then you also sue U.S. Bank for Section 1681 S2B. And so the judge is acknowledging this. Now, I think, I'm not trying to be hyper-technical here, but I do want to maybe add something to what the judge says. Judge says, the consumer has either a claim under 1681 S2B against U.S. Bank or a claim under 1681 I against Experian. The more accurate way of saying that is, or you can have both. In other words, it's possible Experian did a lousy investigation. It's possible U.S. Bank did a lousy investigation. It's possible they both did a lousy investigation. So you could go to the jury on both of those claims. So I don't want you to take what the judge said here as that you have to only choose one of these at the end of the day. No, that's not what the judge is saying. Or if it is, the judge is mistaken here. You can have both of these claims. And judge just points out, need not establish which theory will ultimately pan out before she filed her complaint. Again, just understand, you can get a jury verdict on both of these. It's just like, and I often do this, I go back to car wrecks because it's easy to understand. You could say, hey, this truck driver was negligent and this person in a van was negligent and they crashed into my car and they both were negligent. Well, it can ultimately be that the truck driver was negligent and the person driving the van was negligent and you get a verdict against both of them or maybe it's just one or the other. So it could be at the end of the day, the plaintiff may only get a verdict against U.S. Bank or only get a verdict against Experian but they might get it against both. Okay, let's go back to the this uh, arguments here by U.S. Bank. It said, the consumer did not plausibly allege that it willfully violated the law. And that's what you have to have under 1681N. And if you have that, which is willfulness or recklessness, then you get statutory damages up to $1,000 per violation. That's different than the FDCPA the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, that's up to 1,000 total. This is 1,000 per violation. I mean, we have cases where we might have disputed things a half a dozen, a dozen times, and it keeps getting verified. Well, there, those would be multiple, multiple statutory violations. And you can get punitive damages to punish U.S. Bank and to deter or discourage U.S. Bank and other furnishers from doing the same bad conduct. So plaintiff may prove willful violation through evidence of reckless disregard. Well, what does that mean? Company ran a risk of violating law substantially greater than the risk associated with a reading that was merely careless. And if you know the risk and you fail to take any precaution against it, that gives us an indication this is a willful violation. So the consumer says, hey, you ran a greater than careless risk. And in this Killingsworth case, the issue was the defendant charged a higher interest rate based on information it should have known was false. And that was enough to say, this is willful. Johnson, the consumer in this case we're covering, similarly alleges U.S. Bank was apprised of a clear error in the information it furnished to Experian, but failed to investigate the error or fix the information. That's enough under this Killingsworth to plead willful. And U.S. Bank can't say, well, we had a reasonable belief that its conduct was legal because they knew amending the charge-off dates was legally perilous given the precedent, remember that Gillespie case, that the recording of multiple dates in the date of last activity can cause significant confusion and uncertainty for the consumer. So all these arguments by U.S. Bank it's losing. Now it says... Uh, you don't allege actual damages. And the judge, see, under section 1681O, that's for negligence, and that lets you get actual damages. And the, the court says, well, that's kind of meaningless because a willful violation survives. And the consumer said she had mental anguish, humiliation, and embarrassment. Emotional stress damages, if supported with evidence, are recoverable under the FCRA. Now, say some judges would want more detail, and it may be that there was a lot more detail, just the judge didn't quote it. But even in the complaint, some judges want a lot of detail about emotional distress damages, but you certainly 
can do that. You certainly can get emotional distress damages for a violation of the FCRA. And the consumer has pled a plausible pecuniary or financial harm. So here's an example, going back to that Gillespie case. So the FCRA prohibits a consumer reporting agency providing a consumer report containing accounts placed for collection or charged to profit and loss, which are more than seven years old. Okay, and that's from section 1681CA4. So the passage of time benefits consumers because after seven years, a charge off can't be included. There's an exception for what are called uh, large transactions. Okay, but for 99% of people, once that charge off is more than seven years old, it can't be on the report. So the 10 month extension of the charge off date that the consumer alleges plausibly caused harm to her financial situation because it would have kept this delinquent mortgage on her credit report longer than it should have been. And the, the judge points out, even if that was merely negligent, you can get actual damages. So the motion to dismiss is denied. So again, I want you to see this, to see some of these words that we use a lot in this, and I've used them in sort of a PowerPoint type things, you know, we're talking about the furniture and the, the credit bureau and all that, but I wanted you to see them in the opinion. And then at least understand that there are arguments about this sort of date of status. So again, we come back to the, uh, the date of status and the first reported date, which is tied in with the first major delinquency. So just to understand those. Now, again, if you want more detail, let me know, and we'll go through the Metro 2 guide, which is sort of the rule book that the industry puts out for credit bureaus and furnishers and see what it says. And then can you sue both the furnisher and the credit bureau? Absolutely. When you notify the credit bureau and then they say, hey, we reached out to the furnisher and this is verified, then you can and often should sue both of them because you don't really know who messed it up, maybe one or maybe both. And then what about willfulness? Remember, that has to do with they're running a greater risk than just merely carelessness would provide. Okay? And what type of damages? If it's just a negligence case, then you can get emotional distress and financial damages. If it gets up to that willful or reckless, now you can get statutory, which the idea of statutory is this is up to $1,000 per violation, even if you can't prove any damages. This is your incentive to bring the case to get these guys to start doing what they're supposed to. Government doesn't have time to sue them every time they break the law. So they want to encourage consumers to sue. That's also why your lawyer gets paid by the furnisher or the credit bureau at the end of the day. Because again, the government wants to incentivize you to bring these lawsuits and hire a lawyer that knows what he or she is doing to make these guys change. And so you can get statutory damages and punitive damages. So hope you found this helpful and let me know if you continue to like these type of uh, case decisions and uh, let me know any suggestions you have for future videos and we keep a list of all those and we'll keep uh, doing our best to crank out a new video every day. Okay, you guys have a fabulous day. Bye-bye.